the live stream. Welcome, everybody. Uh, wow, this is such a cool group we have here. I was just saying earlier, I'm, I'm always so thrilled and uh, honored when all these amazing people show up to these conversations. And I'm really excited about this one today. So happy to have you all here. Um, let me just get the live stream started. <clears throat> work this time. Hmm. There's, they definitely changed their uh, interface here. Yeah, it's been <clears throat> strange for everyone I know for the past week and a half. You got this to bet. Get your act together. Well, I guess so you guys can continue uh, just just chatting while I get this started. <laughs> hey, Shenzhen. Hey, Neha. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, Tom. And Chad. I don't know if this is going to work again. It's just hanging. This is what it did last our last call as well. Strange. I think we'll have to just post the recording. Yeah, I could try YouTube. We could, yeah, if we stream to YouTube and then just post the YouTube link um, in the event, that may work. Let's try this. But I'm just being a backseat driver here. Nope. Doesn't like that either. Welcome, Ruth. All right, one more try, and then we'll just we'll just roll. People continue to roll in as well, so that's nice. <clears throat> Sorry for the delay. All right, well, I'm gonna see if this will work in the background, but I'm just gonna get started. So yeah, wow, thank you for being here. Uh, my name's Tibet, for those who think most of you know me, but I'm one of the core stewards of the Taran Collective. And we are, we've are we been hosting these, these live stream, in theory, live stream conversations um, over the last few weeks as part of our uh, launch of our crowdfunding campaign for Hilo, the platform, the social coordination platform for a thriving planet that we um, are stewarding. And um, today we have a, a really wonderful conversation planned with some of our core partners that have been supporting us and working with us and helping resource the work on Hilo over the last several months. Um, we have Dan Kittredge of the Bionutrient Food Association and Lisa Stokey of Next7. And um, we'll get much more of an intro and <clears throat> um, much more from them in a bit. Um, Neha here, here is also going to be guiding that conversation. But I just wanted to start by um, doing a little bit of a, an overview of Hilo for those of you that maybe haven't seen our, our kind of intro and uh, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish. And then we'll shift into our work together with Dan and Lisa on um, mycelia.earth. Um, so I'm going to share my screen for a moment. Or actually, before that, I just wanted to <clears throat> I'm really wonderful to hear, see everybody um, sharing where they're at and what territories they're in. I'm actually calling in from uh, Taos, New Mexico. I'm on a road trip right now. I'm right on the Taos Pueblo at my friend Megan's house. And Megan's mom is an amazing permaculturist and she's working with the Pueblo. And it's it's really beautiful to be here. It's a really special place. My first time here, um, the, the Pueblo, the built, some of the buildings there are the oldest continuously inhabited buildings in the United States, there are like a thousand years of continuous um, people living in them, uh, which is really amazing. And so, yeah, just always want to start all of our, our meetings and our calls um, with acknowledgement of the land that we're on, um, acknowledgement of the history of this country and how all of our work um, 
is, you know, we, we live on occupied territory, um, this whole country. And it's just really important to acknowledge that the work that we do is, has to include the healing and the integration of our, our history, um, both in the ways that we have, uh, you know, oppressed and committed violence against indigenous people, as well as the slaves who, who built this country um, who were taken from Africa. And so we just really want to uh, acknowledge that at the beginning of everything that we do. And our work is in service to that healing and also in service to the next seven generations. I'm kind of trying to, to bridge and heal and integrate and move forward in a good way. So yeah, thank you. Um, with that said, I want to share my screen and just do a quick presentation about Hilo. Many of you have probably seen this before, um, but you know, we're, we're here to support this work. And so yeah, I want to make sure everybody is grounded in, in what we're doing. So yeah, Hilo is a, a social coordination platform for a thriving planet that the Terran Collective has been stewarding since, um, since March. And it was uh, given to us in a, a really beautiful way as, a, as basically a gift um, through a partnership with the, the original founders of Hilo Edward West and Julia Pope and um, and Hollow of Hollow Chain, this organization that's trying to uh, create the distributed internet of the future. We had a, a conversation with the Hollow team um, last week. And, and, Aaron, I'm going to mute you. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's been given to us as a gift and, and our goal is to build this tool and give it as a gift back to the world um, with the mission of amplifying cooperation among people working to regenerate our communities and our planet. Um, it's a really big goal and, and a big mission and so we're excited to be kind of launching onto this long term project with all of you um, and, you know, doing it kind of with community. So. Yeah, so why, why Hilo? Um, you know, we basically see that, of course, there's so much collapsing around us right now. Our ecosystems, our planet is, you know, the, the impact that we as, as a civilization have had on our planet uh, is dramatic and, and really scary right now. And our institutions are not really built to handle it. Um, and they're kind of collapsing under the weight of, of um, yeah, a lot of kind of existential threats um, and, and a breakdown of trust is kind of the main way that we put it. But at the same time, there's this like growing movement to create a world that works for all and, and kind of uh, create this new, new ways of living and, and being in relationship with the land and with each other. And so we see a need for a coordination tool that will kind of really support and enable that, that community to thrive and to connect and to collaborate and to coordinate. And, um, that is why we're working on Hilo. Um, yeah, so as I said, you know, we see like the core problem that we're facing is a breakdown of trust. Um, so, you know, we've lost trust in each other. There's, you know, as many of you may have seen the social dilemma, like there's really a concerted effort actually to create polarization and distrust and violence against each other, um, as well as uh, not necessarily like on purpose efforts, but just the way that our systems are designed right now um, our transactional capitalist structures of coordinating uh, create less and less or less need for trust. And so we've stopped being in community in, in trusted ways. Um, our institutions are, are old at this point. They haven't adapted to modern life, to a global interconnected planet. And our democracy in, in this country is just no longer really functioning in the way it's meant to function. And so we've lost trust in our institutions and in our media systems. Um, and we've lost connection from our planet and really like no longer have uh, the sense that we can lean into the abundance of this planet and work with it in a good way because most people don't really have a connection to it. Um, and as I mentioned, our technologies, our current venture capital backed platforms pr for profit, public platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are doing more harm than good at this point. So to yeah, rebuild the trust um, that we see as needed right now. We need to coordinate effectively um, and with each other and, and figure out how to cooperate and collaborate. And we need a new class of technologies to do that, a new tech commons is the way we think of it. Um, and 
that's what we're trying to do with Arlo. So yeah, there's there's kind of like some key pieces. Every every aspect of the design of Hilo uh, is is around how do we rebuild relationship, strengthen trust, rebuild community, and then from there we can build in tools for better collective governance, uh, um, making this good decisions together. Um, you know, having the ability to to map and really be aware of what's happening uh, in your community on the land that you're in. Um, feeding back into then you know having more trust with each other and in, in community, um, and it's just it's just a whole different paradigm of what we're designing for. It's not to suck your attention and sell you things. It's to rebuild trust, rebuild connection and community, and learn to cooperate with each other. Um, yeah, I, I kind of just went through this a little bit, but there's a whole bunch of different ways we're building into the platform. Uh, ways to connect more deeply with each other, to work on projects together, to find each other locally, to do mutual aid um, through meeting each other's needs, through asks and offers. Um, and uh, the, the way that we are um, trying to accomplish this is, is through a kind of like new design of, well, kind of new and ancient, I would say, and that it's like based on the way that nature works. Um, but uh, an architecture that enables small groups to coordinate with each other into in larger communities and communities to coordinate each other in larger networks and networks to coordinate with each other in larger movements um, and create the ability for the, the kind of collaboration and cooperation both within groups and then across groups and communities and networks in ways that aren't really possible now with current systems. Um, so some of the ways we see this being used and are already being used, but also you know what we're designing for is uh, organizing alternative food systems, creating local resilience and security um, as, as things collapse around us, that's really important. Uh, mutual aid networks, this is something that's, you know, during coronavirus has obviously become really, really necessary and important and communities are, are doing it all over the world. And so we want to build better tools for that. And, and the seeds and the core of that art foundation of that already exists in Hilo. Um, and yeah, collective governance in a way that feels that's like, actually speaks to the voice of the people and what, what people want. Um, and bioregional coordination and place-based coordination and collaboration. Um, we have a whole set of mapping functionality that is core to what we're trying to do with Hilo uh, because we see like connecting locally with the land and with each other, who, the people that are around us is kind of the way we can have the most impact and create the most change in the world. These are our, our design principles. And as, as I mentioned, designing for the next seven generations relationship center design, co-creating with our, our community, with the people who want to do this work, um, being fully transparent in, you know, the code is open source, our governance, our financial systems, all of it is, is shared and will be shared. Working to be interoperable with as many other aligned platforms as possible. Um, never selling people's data, people own their own data and can decide what they want to do with it. Um, yeah, really trying to design to be inclusive and design for all the voices um, that are, on this planet uh, need to be included in this kind of just transition that we're working towards. And collective stewardship, so working cooperatively and, and turning this eventually into a platform co-op where all of the stakeholders, all the members and contributors will have some say in, in how Hilo is built. And we're already doing that. Um, we are working to publish uh, a roadmap. This is kind of a preview, although I wouldn't say it's like perfect. It, this will continue to evolve and some of these things will probably happen sooner. Um, but to some of the things we're working on. And these are the folks that are working on it. A bunch of them are here on this call. Um, myself and Neha and Claire and Aaron and Kelly being the core stewards of Terran and Shen Shen and Lauren and Tom have, have jumped in and been doing software development and participating in the design. <clears throat> and it's a wonderful team to work with. Um, I mentioned Hilo being a gift to us and a gift to the world. Um, it's open source, it's free. Uh, we are running it as a nonprofit, and we are gonna, we're going to be resourced through donations um, and philanthropy. And so uh, we'll post a link to the crowdfunding campaign, but would love your support in this, in this epic mission. Um, yeah, so we're trying to raise 100000 by the end of November from the crowdfund. And we're also starting conversations with other partners and, and bigger philanthropists and, and trying to bring in <clears throat> a big chunk of resource so we can really... Um, yeah, really just get moving on this project that uh, we see as so important for right now. 
so yeah, please join us, support the campaign, share it. Um, there's a Hilo community we will post the link to that you can join if you want to be part of kind of building, co-creating, designing Hilo. Um, and that's it. I'll wrap up there so we can move into the meat of our call and conversation today. Um, but thank you for listening, especially if you've heard it before. <laughs> um, and I will stop sharing my screen. Cool. Yeah, so welcome. And I want to pass it over to Neha to introduce our guests and um, get the conversation going. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Tibet. And thank you, everyone, um, especially those who have seen this before and are still here. It's um, really nice to see everyone's faces in this way. Um, and, and two things I just wanted to share before we trans transition into the next part of the conversation. Um, one is that we really hope to be building these things, not so that we can spend more time on screens, but so that our time on screens actually guides us to have our hands in soil more. So for us, the less time and the more efficient we can make that time to actually come and be together in relationship with the land, the better. And the other part is that it takes some really special foresight and some people with really strong faith to see that this dream can be birthed into reality. And we really have to honor Dan Kittredge and Lisa Stokey here. Um, Dan came in with Bionutrient Food Association um, with such a strong faith in us and really saw what was possible in, in doing things in this way. And so we do this work to bring the mission of those in the world to life. And that of both Next7 and BFA is something that is so close to our hearts, so aligned in our values that it was just a, a full body yes to work together, at least from the Terran side. So we want to shift and shine a light on their work for the rest of the call today. Um, so with that, I would love to welcome Dan to the virtual circle. Um, Dan, if you could introduce yourself a little bit and tell us more about the Bionutrient Food Association, that would be great. All right. Um, uh, my name is Dan Kittredge. I'm a lifelong organic farmer and have been running the, the Bionutrient Food Association for the last 10 years for an educational nonprofit uh, focused on uh, increasing quality in the food supply. And by quality, we're talking about flavor, aroma, uh, nutritive value, health giving attribute, um, not so much about the label, but about the inherent value. Um, so we've been working around North America and Europe in the last um, you know number of years, uh, working with growers and um, We've got a project uh, called the Real Food Campaign that we started about four years ago, which has a number of, of partners in it, um, Next7 being one, but a number of different uh, other nonprofits, universities, companies, philanthropists, et cetera, uh, working on a project um, to do three basic things. One is to define um, the variation of nutrient levels in food, uh, which are quite profound, um, to identify what causes that variation, which is basically how you interact with the earth. And then uh, uh, finally to um, give people the ability to choose um, what they eat, what they purchase based on its inherent nutritional value. So I'll just go into that for one second. Um, you know, people may have had the experience of eating a tomato off of the vine when it's ripe and or eating a tomato off the shelf in January and experiencing a, a sort of a, you know, a different <laughs> sensation uh, in your body. Um, that nose and tongue that we've got are, are, are nutrient monitoring devices that tell you what's good for you and what's not. And when something doesn't particularly taste good, it, it actually means technically it doesn't have nutrition in it. So you may get a, you know, a, a, a carrot that says certified organic on it, but your, but your tongue says, meh, not so interested. Um, you trust your tongue, not the label is what I would say. Um, and so as we've been, you know, engaging in this project, we've been building. Uh, we've got three labs now: uh, one in California, one in Michigan, one in France. Um, 
we're sampling about 20 crops this year. We did six last year and two a couple of years ago. Um, and we found variation in the nutrient levels that's um, hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of percent, as in this leaf of spinach has as much iron in it as those 18 leaves of spinach. This carrot has as much copper in it as those three carrots. Um, I think our, our most significant outlier was, I think it was antioxidants in spinach. And we found, you know, this leaf of spinach had as many antioxidants in it. If you ate that one leaf on January 1st, you'd have to eat one leaf of the worst one we found every day for these, for a year to get the same amount, literally 364 and a half to one. Like this, this leaf had that much more nutrients in it than that one did. Um, so the variation in our food supply from a nutritional standpoint is massive. We understand that it correlates directly to how the plants are grown, their microbiome, the epigenetics, the management practices, the soil health, the carbon cycle, sequestration, um, farm viability, all these things connect directly um, as well, we think, to nutrition, to, to uh, health. You know, um, most of the, what they're called uh, non-communicable diseases, um, cancers and diabetes and heart disease and all those things that are sort of the plagues of Western society um, are correlated directly with nutritional deficiencies. You know, in our, so we basically are getting plenty of calories, but not enough nutrition in our food. And so um, we have this broad vision that if we can support people in choosing the food that's best for them and their families, that will also be a direct solution for um, climate issues because plants are actually really good at, you know, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil um, and uh, any number of other sort of systemic um, solutions oriented perspectives. So there may apparently be these existential crises from one mode of analysis, from one perspective, from our side, it's like, you know, the solutions are at our fingertips. And so let's implement them. And um, so that's broadly what we do with the organization, education, research, uh, et cetera, conferences. Um, but we've thought, you know, really that if our mission is increasing quality in the food supply, like increasing what people are taking in so they can become more coherent and manifest more of their, you know, inherent potential. And I would suggest not just in the physical plane, but other levels of being um, that we need to also think about the things we're taking in that aren't literally food, our thoughts, our ideas, our emotions, our communications, etc. And um, so, you know, I've had this idea for many years that we need, you know, the, the internet is a wonderful tool, potentially, um, but it can also be something that's used to facilitate um, control. And only when we actually have a communications framework that's predicated on principles of, of life, of synergy and collaboration and um, transparency and, you know, respect and honor, um, not on um, <clears throat> whatever you'd want to call it, you know, um, exploitation, uh, commercialization, power over division, um, you know, only when we actually have that communication framework um, or should we expect our culture to be able to become more coherent. And so rather than wait for um, Facebook to see the light or Amazon or Google um, to stop data mining, um, we thought with our you know, relatively limited resource, uh, it was time to start working on this project. And so we, um, this, this spring after, you know, things got a little bit <laughs> ruffled up, it was like, okay, what are we going to do? Um, let's work on this. And we, we had started talking about it in January and we were hoping to start doing the work by the end of the year. Um, but it felt like we sort of needed to move up the timetable. So we, we looked around and um, you know had heard a number of good things uh, about about Hilo and um, did some due diligence, talked to a number of different groups, and and found that this was the this was the group that was most aligned in principle with what we're trying to accomplish. So, um, how's that for a short overview? <laughs> Brilliant. Thank sufficient? you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing and. And I, I just really want to highlight the, the holistic approach and the mindset that you're bringing to all of this. It's 
really special and um, it's not lost on us how valuable that is and how lucky we are to have sort of fallen and, and danced into this partnership. Um, and Lisa would love to hear a little bit more about you and your life's work and uh, next seven. Thanks, Neha. Um, I also, before I start, um, we're doing some work on real food campaign and food for future right now. And so our web person, or you know, he does our graphic design, he just sent me a photo of Dan as he was talking. So I thought that was kind of cool. I had to share it. Do you see it, Dan? No. It's in the chat. It's when it's you standing at Whole Foods like 10 years ago with all your long hair and your baby face. <laughs> I'm not very sophisticated when it comes to these computer I things. know. It's OK. You probably know the photo. But anyway, I just wanted to, I just thought it was really kind of fun to share that. It was the it was uh, Dan said real food campaign started four years ago. I think that's his messaging team because it was the lab that started four years ago. But Dan started this endeavor with real food campaign before he started Bionutrient Food Association, actually. So he's made a lot of progress, you know, from just getting out there and educating people um, about what real food is, um, to starting these organizations, to starting a lab, to um spectrometer to everything so um it's really pretty cool yeah well, I didn't tell the spectrometer really but yeah what's that i didn't tell him about the spectrometer oh okay in fact can you just have 30 more seconds i think you should i think yeah. you should yeah um you know the sort of the, the the master plan or i call it the shiny object um is a uh literally it's a handheld ray gun that um you flash a light at the carrot or at the milk or at the rice and it bounces back and you can read what's in it. So literally go to the grocery store, flash light at the carrots, burp, burp, junk, you know, next bag of carrots, burp, burp, decent, next bag, burp, burp, good. You know, you have in your hand the capacity to assess nutritionally what is or is not in the food in front of you. So you can use that economic power to incentivize the supply chain to focus on nutrition as opposed to volume, because right now everything's focused on the surface and and, and volume, but not actually on nutrition. And so, um, my parents helped to you know write some of the first organic standards in the country in the '80s. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, you know that's a binary system. It's a black and white system. You are organic or you're not. Um, you know, GMOs. You're either non-GMO or you are GMO. And life is not that way. Life is not a is not binary. Life is a continuum. And so, our, you know, our plan, and we've actually built the first generation of that hardware, and we've got it calibrated now. Um, so, you know, for the first six crops, we've got calibrations for. You can go to the grocery store, flash a light at the carrot, and get a reading: red, yellow, green. Um, so, we're working on the next generation of that. Hopefully, I'm not sure when it'll be out. Maybe a couple of years. But the idea, effectively, is to give the power literally to people to see transparently right past the marketing and the labeling um, and use that self-interest. This will taste better. It'll make my child healthier. It is was grown in a way that heals the earth. Um, you know, give us that actual visceral power. Um, that's really the sort of the, the thing people know our, know our work for. I forgot to finish that. So thank you. Somebody wanted to sign up for it already, Dan. So <laughs> I just I just shared the URLs. Uh, yeah, we're 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 we we sold out of the first batch. We're um, we got we got back orders. It's uh, that you can't you can't order one right now, but <laughs> we got four hundred in the lab. Get on the wait list anyway, right? You can get on the waiting list. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Probably in the next month or so, we'll be shipping them out again. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, it's very exciting. <clears throat> so. Um, Thank Sorry. you, everybody. My name is Lisa Stokey, as Neha stated. Oh, hopefully, I'm not on mute. No, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> um, and my organization is Next Seven Project, um, of which Dan is on the on the board of that as well. And um, my previous work, maybe I'll just give some of my background. I've done a lot of work in food and agriculture advocacy um, as a full-on activist. 
Um, a lot of people used to call our work tip of the spear work. We were those people that really annoyed Dan back in the day before he knew me that were making all kinds of noise on GMOs. And those of you who have lived in California for a while probably recall the ballot initiative in 2012 to label genetically engineered foods and my organization, Food Democracy Now, along with a few others and some really wonderful organic companies started that ballot initiative there. And so I did a lot of work on that over the years and just work, um, just really pushing back against large agriculture and seed companies like Monsanto in particular. Um, and on behalf of farmers, we are in a lawsuit against Monsanto challenging their patents. I used to do a lot of regulatory work, um, political work. Um, I did that for, you know, a good while. And then um, I guess I just began to feel like we just pushed this huge boulder up the hill of raising awareness of the problems of our food system and felt like people were really now starting to desire like um, what the solutions were. I was like, okay, I, now I know what I can't eat or shouldn't eat or shouldn't support. What should I support? What should I eat? What can I give my kids? It's healthy for them. So um, next seven, was actually born in my mind I found in my journal in 2012 and next seven is about thinking about the next seven generations and reorienting our systems and our focus towards thinking about you know all of the things that we do thinking about the next seven generations um, and so we're naturally starting with food uh, food and agriculture um, I met Dan in 2017 right after I um, did a um, a campaign alongside a lot of the foundational organic farmers in the US to protect the organic standards. I've done a lot of work on that. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people in the country that have been associated with organic, for example, felt that when hydroponic was approved as organic, um, you know, that it didn't have to be in the soil any longer, that we had just lost way too much with the standards. And so there's a lot of people in 2017 looking for other, other ways to, um, you know, bring the food to the people that they were really seeking or help them to find it. So um, right after I was done with that uh, campaign, um, I met Dan, like literally like two or three days later. <laughs> and he was there talking about everything he just shared with you. And that really enthused me because I felt like that, um, you know, was what we really needed. I'm a mom of four kids and I have had to go to through really great lengths um, growing up in Iowa and raising them in Iowa, um, where there's obviously a lot of genetically engineered crops um, to find them food. And of course, um, I began to realize that just getting food that was non-GMO, which is important, um, no pesticides, which was also important, but also what we're eating food for is not for what we want to avoid, but what, what we want to you know, really nourish ourselves with. And so with, um, after joining with Real Food Campaign um, and working closely with Dan on that over the last, I don't know, three years, I guess, um, I've really come to understand a lot about that. So uh, next seven is we're really excited. We're getting ready to launch our Food for Future campaign um, and our, our future, uh, the future in humanity. So um, we're doing a gardening series right now to show people how to do this with the help of Dan. We just went to Minneapolis a few days ago and that's one of our next seven gardens and we had a lot of fun there. And thankfully we all survived with Dan <laughs> cutting down everything from tilling up garden to cutting down big trees and falling out of trees with active chainsaws and whatever. So, you know, we're not, we don't just do it from behind our computer. We get, <laughs> we get out there and make it happen and we're trying to inspire other people you know to just it's really all about showing people from next seven's perspective the um the abilities and the power that they have to create the world that they want to see and that's that's really what's behind next seven um bringing us all together um to create under this new consciousness that i am experiencing coming in um as the old is yes collapsing that coming together, working in harmony with nature, 
in our natural systems that are always regenerating. And um, it's just really about teaching people how to plug into those natural systems. And we're doing it with food and agriculture and um, nourishing ourselves too. So that's primarily my work right now. And we're excited to be here with you guys too. We've really enjoyed working with the Terrans. So thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Dan. And <clears throat> I'm going to try to to swiftly run us through the next because I do want to save time for Q&A. We have some awesome people on the call here. I see Wanda, I see Amanda, lots of folks who are in the food and agriculture space and doing incredible work. Um, so I want to make sure that they have a chance to, to also share a little bit. Um, but Lisa and Dan, you uh, touched on this a bit, uh, but can you share a little bit more about how Mycelia.Earth came to be and how that led to Hilo and our work together? Um, I think we had talked about it certainly in the past as part of our you know, brainstorming visioning sessions, um, you know, as a piece of the puzzle that's necessary for um, the sort of systemic revitalization of culture, um, you know, that we, we, want to, we want to acknowledge the potential values of electronic communications, um, but we want them to be, we want to have a, a framework to engage them through that's honorable and um, based on, you know, sort of life's principles. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it was, it's, it's been sort of, just one of those things like it needs to happen until this happens, a lot of problems aren't gonna be solved. Um, it's, you know, like until people have good food to eat, they're not gonna be healthy and they're probably not gonna be intelligent. Um, and they're definitely not gonna be able to ground their true spiritual natures. Um, and probably the environment's gonna be in rough shape. So like we need to get good food. Like that's just something that has to happen. And in my mind, the, um, the amount of information and um, the type of information that people experience through their screens um, is, I think, it, it's it's quite it's it's um, it's profoundly profoundly perverse. It's deeply traumatizing. Um, it's it's you know really. I think I got this line from Lisa a couple of years ago: uh, "Where attention goes, energy flows." Um, you know, if we're busy thinking about fear and anger and us versus them and what was us and the world's over, um, then we can help make that by thinking that. And if we want to think that, you know, life is brilliant and profound and we all have, you know, uh, you know, common nature, um, and we're in this together, um, we can make that happen. So, um, you know, it seems to me that the way that the dominant paradigm propagates fear through electronic communications um, needs to be, I mean, I'm not saying get rid of the internet, but we need to have a framework for communicating that's, that's basically predicated on empowerment, not on control. Um, so that's, that's the basic insight for me. Um, and, you know, it's overwhelmingly large, of course, but if you don't start, then um, how can you make forward progress? Mm. If not us, who, if not now, when? Something along those lines. <laughs> That's my short answer, or not short. <laughs> Lisa, did you want to say anything? Um, well, I mean, I have a lot of things that are coming to my mind, obviously, when you say that. Um, and I had a really good call with the Terrans a few weeks ago, you know, sharing some of my experiences and some of the political work that I did. And um, just really, um, you know, highlighting the need for an independent platform, just like Dan was saying, you know, that was, that was people owned, that was based upon em empowerment and grounded more in that, that newer consciousness, right, that was not based on control and um, extraction of humans, but based upon, you know, res respect and empowerment and 
um, acknowledgement, right? And so um, that's why when Dan had shared with me the, um, that he found the Terrans, he's talked about mycelia for a really long time, the idea. We've had a lot of a lot of times over the years talking about it. So it's it's been a really cool thing to see it um, begin to come to life um, as, as a platform for people to communicate um, in that way. I'm, there's like I said, there's a lot I could say about it. I'm trying to be brief, but in the in the work that I'll just say that in the work that I've done in the past, I've seen the the real ill effects on people's lives when they haven't had the you know the basic right of privacy, basically, and uh, sovereignty. And um, so I know it's I know how destructive it can definitely be. So I'm very appreciative of the work that the Terrans are doing. Thank you so much. Um, and just to provide a little bit more context for everyone that's on the line here, um, we have been collaborating with BFA and Next7 for the last few months. And the way that that has taken form is that for about every other week for, I would say three to four months, we were getting on a design session and just having a conversation with farmers, permaculturists, systems thinkers, homesteaders, to hear from them what they would need and what they would want from a platform like this. And that has informed some of the most core features that you're seeing today. And specifically the map um, that you see in Hilo now was made possible because of these partnerships and these collaborations. Um, so given that that's what we've been doing to date. And today our conversations are really focused on soil and nutrition. Um, what does it mean to be thinking deeply about this food security, food for the future? Um, we're really noticing that this is an important time in our culture. When you have things like the social dilemma and kiss the ground come out, uh, these conversations about technology and sovereignty and transparency and regeneration are no longer fringe. They are much more digestible to the mainstream and the rest of the world. And so in many ways, the tools need to be ready for folks to be making this transition. So as we think about the future of Mycelia and our partnership, what do you, Dan and Lisa, see as your ideal vision? What do you hope to say maybe six months or a year from now? Uh, on Mycelia, um, which is a community on Hilo, um, I think our, our, our three month target was 20,000 posts and 25 organizations. I don't think we're gonna hit that, um, but I'm still aiming for it, <laughs> whether it happens sooner or later. Um, the way I see it, um, there is an amazing amount of people, organizations, networks doing real things on the land, in community, in local culture, um, that there's no real place to find. Um, like you want to, I mean, we, we've, this is all the design session stuff we've been talking about is, okay, um, you know, we're interested in climate change and we want to work on um, this piece of land here and re regenerating it, rejuvenating it. We need access to the right seed stock, the seedlings, um, the knowledge about what to be planting where and when. Um, we want to go out and, you know, do some wild foraging. We want to volunteer on a farm. We want to get, um, you know, where's the farmer's markets? Um, who can teach me how to make um, herbal tinctures? I mean, just from that little bit of it, the food sort of food culture movement. Um, there are a lot of amazing people with great knowledge and real skills and, you know, values, value, um, but there's no way to find them. There's no structure to self-organize around solutions that we can find. Um, and, you know, having been personally part of the organic farming movement for, for 30 plus years, there's all these really wonderful organizations around the country, and not just this country, of course, around the world, that no one necessarily knows about. They're small, they're grassroots, they have 200 or 400 people come to their conferences, but they've got you know, a great web of knowledge in the region um, that the general populace probably is entirely oblivious to. So um, 
from from my my perspective, sort of seeing who's there and and creating a space where we support them being seen in relationship to each other, um, that feels to me like you know the way we can get critical mass for people to engage in an alternate platform. If all the cool people doing all the cool things are here, and there's no data mining and there's no advertising. Um, and you have the ability to be self-organizing around action, not just around posting. Um, that that's 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 where I'm heading. That's what I, I think is how we can take the work we've done and and ground it in in real. Um, you know, we have to go to critical mass. We can't just build a software platform. We actually have to figure out how to get people to use it. Otherwise, who cares? Um, so, in my mind, that's that's the way forward. Beautiful. Well, did you want me to say something too? If you, yeah. If okay. you. That's inspired. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I echo everything that Dan that Dan said, and that was that was why we also joined, um, you know, joined this effort, this project. Um, you know, I just I can just give like you know some of the context for me personally is that like I said, feeding my kids and growing, you know, them growing up in Iowa, it was really really difficult to source um healthy food and um you know i used to have to drive two hours one way up to minneapolis to go to a co-op to get food for them and so i really had to kind of organize my life around that and and so i you know now i live in boulder and of course i have access to a lot more food and it's just you know I, it was a piece of heaven when i first came here i was pinching myself literally and almost in tears that I could just drive down the road and get organic kale any anytime I wanted, you know, I just could hardly believe it. And it just gives some perspective for a lot of people that are, you know, living in food deserts, whether they be, you know, within a city or in a rural environment or whatever. Um, you know, that's a that's a real thing. And so I, I think it's a really it's a beautiful kind of reciprocity that can take place. Um, that we can use the the internet and technology for, you know, for really for the good, is helping people connect to farmers and help farmers find, um, you know, those those consumers, and then also, you know, hopefully in the future, um, being able to overlay some of that with the data that we have discovered with Real Food Campaign, and um, you know, basically what we're finding, especially with the 2019 report, as an example, is that. You know, when we do grow in these biological systems, you know, in harmony with nature, um, we grow more nutrient dense food. And so um, it'd be really beautiful to use mycelia um, to help people connect with that and find that. And as Dan likes to say, create that race to the top and not to the bottom, create the demand for that kind of food. So um, that's what I would really love to see um, flourish on mycelia. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, incredible. Well, I do see we have a couple of uh, questions and we can transition into Q&A. Um, to bet, Dan, Lisa, is there anything else that I'm missing or that you want to share before we transition to that part? Yeah, I just want to, first of all, say like thank you, express a lot of gratitude to Dan and Lisa for supporting us and in, in, especially in the early um, you know, we just taken over Hilo and we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we really shift to focusing fully on this, uh, or, or at least for myself, focusing fully on this as, as my work right now. And it's amazing not only to have you step in and, and uh, give the resources needed to do that, but also work so closely with us. And then just to, to have the um, source of life for Hilo come from people working on food and agriculture and working on the land and not from a traditional investor or someone in tech or it's just such a different mm -hmm. energy um, and it's it's really really cool and really special so I just wanted to thank you both so much it's been wonderful to work with you sure <laughs> and we do have a bunch of questions I don't know are you are you both able to stay a few minutes over Five or ten minutes more. I think we were going to be on a call after this together, so we can postpone that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Great. I have a call that's coming in, but I maybe have a minute. 
I can I can okay. stand the lecture minutes if, if, if you want. I'm hoping they don't call again because it's really loud. <laughs> Try and text them. Um, so let's see. We have a bunch of questions in here. Um, I think the the first one that was asked by Canyon is about um, relationship with indigenous communities um, in this work, and is is that is there that happening now, or is there a plan for um, building more relationship and connection with indigenous communities? Yeah, I can. I mean, do you may take that, Lisa, or do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. You have a really interesting perspective on that, as shared by Reggie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a white man, obviously, um, or maybe not obviously, but I, that's certainly how people perceive me. Um, um, I don't particularly identify that way, but who cares? Um, so it's topics like this sometimes are, you know, it's like, you know, you might as well just not say anything, but I, I do feel like I have something to say. Um, um, I just was uh, in Minneapolis this weekend and spent the morning with um, Reginaldo Hazlitt Marroquin, who's um, from Guatemala, grew up, you know, very in his in his community, tribal community culture. Um, he's the head of the Regenerative Ag Alliance, um, which is doing amazing work, brilliant work, uh, raising chickens in polycultures, organically, certified organic, with like competing with, um, I'm not sure if they're at the price point of uh, some of the mass brands yet, but they're very, very close. They're actually working with nature strategically, systemically to produce meat, certified organic, you know, at a much lower price point. That's sort of that magical, um, you know, middle ground, which no one seems to be able to accomplish. Um, and I'll, I'll just quote him, although I do think that what, you know, it resonates with me. Um, his point is, we are all indigenous to the earth. Um, and some of us are native to different areas. And I think in my mind as somebody who grew up on the land, didn't wear shoes, you know, people have been working the land in my lineage, direct lineage, uh, you know, as far back as you can go. Um, I feel like there's um, a mistake between the relationship with the land and the genetic material. I think in my mind, the, 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 real, the real point about indigenousness has to do with your relationship to nature, not so much with your genetic heritage. Um, so I know it's probably controversial. Um, uh, we certainly do have a number of people in the BFA that have, you know, native bloodlines who are speaking at our conference. Um, Reggie is one of them. Um, there's a number of others um, that are doing great work around around the around the country. Um, but I just I just want to see if we can broaden the conversation to um, our each of us in our relationship with nature as a central point, and not have a bifurcation of an us versus them. I would say we are all colonized in our cultures, in our our, our families, our family traditions. Um, we have all endured profound traumas um, through many generations and we're all struggling. And um, so it's maybe it's a side note, but, but for me, it's about that, that finding us all as, as finding what we have in common and organizing around that as opposed to organizing around what we don't have in common. Um, so I'm not sure if I said that well, but... <clears throat> I feel very strongly about it <laughs> as someone who can go out and walk the land and see things that most people can't see. You know, I, I feel like I have the, I have the perspective that one would refer to as indigenous in this conversation. Um, and um, and I'm a white man. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say Thank you for sharing. Uh, I think this could probably open up a huge <laughs> conversation, <laughs> um, which we may, may not have time to get into right now. Um, <laughs> I would love to hear your perspective, Wanda. I know um, Lisa has to leave and um, Dan might have to leave in a, in a couple more minutes and we could stay and 
have more conversation after that, I'm, I'm available to stay for a little bit longer. Um, maybe before we get into that, or I don't know, I, I was gonna say we, we could ask one more question before um, Dan and Lisa have to leave. Um, I wanted I, to ask- I'm happy to have a deep conversation and engage, engage the process. Okay. I think it's, but I mean, everybody else has their own lives too. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, is there anything that feels important to talk about or we could just keep this conversation going? Uh, there was one other question if you wanted, I know Lisa, you kind of mentioned this, but what is your view on backyard garden, school garden, hyper-local neighborhood farming movements um, and all of that? If you wanted to say a few words on that before you have to jump. <clears throat> sure, what's our, what's our view on it? Is that what you said? That was the question in the chat, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think they're great. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, one thing, you know, Dan and I just had a call yesterday with somebody who is starting a business in uh, Toronto. And they were talking about, you know, helping people grow food much more locally, like in their own yards and even in like little boxes in their house, you know, and whatever. And, um, you know, Dan had a really great response to that. He was like, you know, anywhere, you know, that you can grow food that's nutritious. I mean, awesome. Right. And I think that that's, so that's really our focus. Our focus is to, you know, I guess it's a number of things. One thing I see out here in Colorado, for example, is that we see a lot of people growing food in um, boxes or raised beds, I guess. And when I first moved here from Iowa, in Iowa, you can basically throw a seed in the backyard and it'll sprout, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's so easy to grow food there. Um, and when I came to Colorado, it was not the case. And so when we started our garden here this year in Colorado, um, you know, to, to demonstrate to people is how to do this with the protocols that BFA, um, Biomutrient Food Association recommends, um, you know, we could barely get into the soil and we could have gone to the store and gotten, you know, bags and trucked in compost and whatever, which is what a lot of people do here because of the way the soil is. But instead we were like, well, this is really an opportunity to show how we regenerate, you know? And I think that's really a key piece to wherever you grow food to show that wherever you're at, it's really about regenerating the food, the land where you are. And that's what helps to create our sovereignty in, in you know, my feeling. Um, and also have food growing, not just this one way system where we're just growing it and eating it, but we're also participating in, the, in those systems, right? Systems thinking where we can regenerate the soil and nurture those microbes in the soil and get minerals in the soil, minerals in our food. And that's really what we're all about. So, you know, whether you're doing that um, in your yard or in a community or on a farm or whatever, you know, I think what we really want to stress is that that's what brings, you know, the the earth that nourishment brings us that, that nourishment and also facilitates our sovereignty um, with feeding ourselves. Dan might have something more to say about that, but that's our focus. I just, yeah, quickly, I think the, the essential point there, um, in many cases, we are taught to buy things and be consumers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in many cases, these backyard gardens, like Lisa is saying, you know, buy the box, buy the soil, buy the seedlings, buy the this, buy the that, buy the other thing. You know, if you did the math out on how many dollars per acre you're spending on materials, you know, if you're a farmer, that's entirely outrageous. And there's no reason why you can't apply these principles that traditional indigenous cultures have worked with for millennia, which is to work with the land as it is, and with very low impact, with very low input, with very low effort, receive profound fecundity. And so that's really what it comes down to, I think, is um, it's, it's great to have a garden. Um, what's really great is to work with nature. and if you're engaging it more as a consumer than as a, as a partner, um, you know, A, it's going to cost more and B, you're less likely to be successful. Um, it's really in my mind about recreating, reconnecting us with nature in whatever environment we're in to the deepest way possible. Um, so 
yeah, there's all kinds of companies and greenwashing and marketing and everything else out there. There always is. Um, but the movement, I think, is great. I mean, when I was a kid, no one knew what compost meant. They'd never heard of yogurt. They'd never heard of granola. They'd never heard of pesto. It was a bunch of stuff <laughs> that are all sort of common, common, common words now. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you if you both have another five minutes, I'd love to pivot back to the conversation that was feeling super alive. Um, <laughs> and I, I say that again. Was it Wanda that wanted to talk? Yeah, yeah. Well, I just wanted to to go back to the original question, which yes. is um, from Canyon. Uh, Any indigenous relatives aligned with Next Seven? Uh, and I, I would love to, to revisit that question. And I also want to acknowledge that in five or 10 minutes, we probably cannot unpack all of this. Um, and yeah, it, I was hearing so many different things. Um, and there- was, there my, my, my comment was, was, was to say, what's the definition of indigenous? That's what I was hearing. I was hearing because a question- assume a certain set of assumption things but right. from someone who grew up in a traditional village in central america in his traditional indigenous perspective quote unquote he's like you white people you have a wrong definition the way the way we're talking about it now is like doesn't fit with his mm -hmm. cultural perspective so yeah. that was all i was trying to say I yeah I'd love to hear what, what Canyon thinks about that. I'd love to hear what Wanda thinks about that. And I also want to throw into the field um, that, and, and I think this was made aware to me a few months ago, probably by you, Wanda, uh, when we would do land acknowledgements in the beginning of conversations and, uh, and re recognizing that there are so many layers and temporal aspects of history. There are many different chapters of people who have been in this place, in this land. And so just wanted to also bring that into the field because it felt like in some way, Dan, you were touching on that. And with that, I'm gonna stop talking. I wanna open it up to Wanda and Canyon for their thoughts. Canyon, it was your question. If you wanna go first, you can. Now, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, first, Dan, I, I want to applaud your courage. Um, I was really glad you withdrew. You're obviously a white man, because I got to say, I look at you and I don't obviously see a white man. Um, and I know many Black people who look whiter than you and would whoop your behind if you called them a white man. Um, <laughs> So, and if we're going to talk in these kind of open terms that we should acknowledge that none of those kinds of things are obvious. Um, but given you looking like a white guy, or it, I have to say the things you said, it has been a challenge for me um, to say those kinds of things. Um, Canyon, in fact, was the first indigenous person that I walked up to in advance of an event we were working on. And I said, hey, Canyon, I think it's time that we start asking all of us, ask for acknowledgement of both the stolen land and the stolen labor, right? And that leaving out the labor part for black folks and, and maybe for many other cultures who have served in raising this country up, uh, that was a point of division, right? It was, it was always hard for me to go, oh yes, in the land acknowledgements, knowing the hundreds of years and bloodshed that my people have given this land. So um, smoothing it out and including everyone, I think is a good thing. But when you start to do, oh, Native Americans and black folks, then you have to go, but what about Latinos? What about the Chinese? What about all the other people whose um, cultures and lives and um, existence have been taken into uh, just abuse. Um, 
And when you spread it all out, you're right. We all are just the same thing, right? I have white blood and there's probably a lot of white people in this picture that have black blood and may not even know. So at some point, I think what you're talking about um, is where we all need to get to. However, when we're talking about things and when Canyon's asking the question of how are you including people who don't, are not obviously white and are beyond that is an important thing to be able to answer, right? Because the sort of smudging all of that is much like somebody going, no, all lives matter, right? And if we take care of the most disenfranchised or um, the least included, then we do include everybody in the indigenous way in which you're speaking, right? And there does need to be a way. I mean, I love the definition of indigenous is about um, your connection to the land um, and not your bloodline. But um, I wanna caution you about the, the fine line, the line between yin and yang, where that can look like either discounting folks, right? Um, or at least minimizing. And right. it's a very fraught, fraught yes. conversation. <laughs> There's no question about it. Yeah, um, fraught it is. Um, I, I mean, personally, I'm offended when people don't consider me to be an indigenous. Mm -hmm. um, I. I will walk a piece of land with anyone and let's have a conversation about it. And let's work with that land. Let's let's work with that land and, and don't tell me I'm not, I don't have that connection. So it's it's something that's really, it's really deeply important to me that that connection is a central part of who I am. Yeah. And I What's just- What's your ethnicity? Like to, How um, do you define yourself ethnically? Uh, my, I think genetically, mostly from Europe. Um, Northern, Western, um, English, Scottish, German, you know, there was plenty of, plenty of slaves, plenty of slaves and servitude in, in Europe not too long ago. Oh, there's a thing the, called a black Irishman. Uh, it, <laughs> I, I'm from Massachusetts. I know about that. Yeah. So I just think, you know, I really were in this all together and the sooner we can get to um, that common place. Yeah which I think is, is love, is nature, um, is You do life. understand how many people are behind you though on that, who sure. can't even see that breath of what you're talking about. I'm, yep, and that's why okay. I don't go out and talk very often. That or you gotta <laughs> get really good at talking about it and do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta prioritize what your, what your central objectives are and your, and your secondary and tertiary objectives and I really think that as we eat more well and we become more coherent in our beings, we will be more vibrationally resonant with the true nature of, of, mm -hmm. of reality. Yeah. And then a lot of these issues will dissipate. I don't yeah. think we're gonna get to it through conversation. I think we're gonna get to it through, you know, vibration. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to talk, but I think our, our beings are much more profound than our minds. And our yeah. beings are are sick. They're literally vibrating out of tune. And that's what fear and anger and separation is, is that dissonant vibration. And so for me, if we can get everybody in the world to have access to food that is more nutritious and get them to be eating it, you get a new body every six months, right? I mean, if we just increased quality in food, we would increase quality of, of culture and consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, that's my hack personally. So I applaud all that and would just ask you that when you go into places like Minneapolis or wherever you go, that you do turn on your four color lenses, right? And make sure to take extra care of those with least, Absolutely. right? Yeah. This, this is a pretty amazing conversation. Uh, and I think <laughs> what makes me really happy with this dialogue is that uh, I have the privilege of being in relationship with Wanda um, from Common Vision, with Dan, with Lisa, and with Canyon. And the way that I see you all going about the world 
is at the core understanding that if we are together with our hands in soil, we will heal relationships. Yep. And I can attest to the fact that Dan, this is probably, I've, I've known Dan, I guess, since March, um, you know, virtually. This is the second time I've seen him uh, on Zoom camera. He is mostly walking the land, just n this is not his his jam. I don't, I don't sit in front of the computer. <laughs> what, what do you call oh, those feet of yours, Dan? What's that? What do you call your feet? My what? Your feet. Oh, uh, all ATF, ATF, all, all terrain feet. Yeah. I put my shoes on in November. <laughs> And, and they yeah. look, they look it. <laughs> I've, I've personally tried scrubbing those feet up and you can't do it. <laughs> ew. <laughs> no, that's not ew, that's nature. <laughs> okay, poo is sometimes ew too. <laughs> and Wanda um, has- I'm talking to you, Wanda, about a number of topics. Incredible yeah. <laughs> um, space here in Oakland at Hoover Elementary and all over. Um, that is such an incredible gathering space where you see children and uh, people of all kinds coming together to weed and um, witness the butterflies and the harvest. And Canyon, I, I know you're putting a lot of chats and haven't read them yet, but I also want to recognize you for the work that you are doing and um, in honoring your, your ancestors the way you take care of your mother, the way you call in community to ensure that they are not forgotten and that their history is not erased and that they are being empowered. Um, I still want to be able to answer your question specifically, and I'm not sure if we're answering that, but I do want to call out all of you and just appreciate you for diving into this dialogue um, and recognize that what we are trying to do is let's actually do shit together. Let's be in relationship in that yeah. way because there is work to do. There is shit that needs to be turned into compost and there is so much land that needs to be loved. Uh, and by finding that common ground, we can also find each other. Um, so I, I, I don't mean to curtail the conversation by any means, but just wanted to appreciate you all in that way. And uh, this type of dialogue, I want to be, I want that to happen more. I want this to become a norm. I want this to be a comfortable space for that to happen. Um, I'm gonna pause there and read Canyon's chat. So if so someone else wants to fill this space, nice. go for it. Well, I have a quick question for you, Neha. Is Wanda, is that where you do your volunteering, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. So I think I had asked you about connecting that garden mm -hmm. with our, with Real Food Campaign. Yep, that's I, right. And I thought that would be really cool to include yep. you <laughs> in doing some of the stuff in the lab. And that'd be great, really cool for the kids to yeah. see what they're growing in the lab. Pretty amazing. Cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll I'd love to time. connect with you, Wanda. You're watching the line. <laughs> I'd love to That's connect with that. you on that with the garden. Yeah. I think they, I think we've got a few overlapping circles. I'm pretty sure we do. Yeah. <clears throat> but that'd be great. Sorry, I was just making that connection just now. And Perfect. Have... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry. But I, TV? I have Something I have out. to jump pretty quick i apologize <laughs> but i've got a couple of people waiting on me at least yeah and i'm trying to hold them off with texts but <laughs> I, I can go and you guys can continue of course i think we can wrap what do you think Sabet? yeah i think we can wrap i'm i'm feeling called to continue this conversation on another call um with anyone who wants to because there's there's a lot alive here um but yeah i think this is a good moment to pause for now. And just once again, thank Dan and Lisa for being here and thank you all for joining and participating. Um, thank you Wanda for speaking up and sharing your voice. And um, yeah, that's all, just gratitude for now. <laughs> Look forward to the next iteration. Yeah. Yeah. The journey thank is just beginning. So
What a lovely group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really great to meet you all. Wanda, I look forward to connecting with you. Thank you. Hey, special people. Bye. <laughs> right. Until next time. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your day. Bye bye. Hey, Wayne. Still with us? <laughs> I guess we can cut the recording. Yeah.